welcome to the Justice Nerd Lecture Series. For those of you who are first timers, um, I am your docent and cruise ship captain, um, Philip Atiba I run the Center for Policing Equity here uh, at John Jay College. Um, and it is today my great pleasure to introduce uh, Annie Papachristos. Um, Dr. Papachristos is an associate professor uh, of sociology at Yale. He's the director of the new policy lab at Yale, um, which is an exceptionally fancy thing. Um, he also has affiliations with the Center for the Study of Inequality uh, through the Life Course, um, the Yale Justice Collaboratory, and the Grand Maharaja of all things methodology and brilliant. Um, <coughs> um, I've had the, the pleasure, I was actually first introduced to um, Andy's work uh, through, uh, so he was being recommended for something very fancy, and they said, what do you know of this guy's work? Here is a whole bunch of it. Um, having not read very much of it as not a sociologist, I said, wow, he's really brilliant. You should give him awards. Um, and as it turns out, lots of us in the field are called to do that, um, and the way that I know is because he wins most of them. Um, <coughs> he is, uh, I think, best understood, and for those of you who have been at uh, Justice Nerd Lecture Series, you understand this is the personal part of it. He's best understood in the field um, as one of the brainiacs that's understanding and giving us language and methods for understanding how relationships matter. And let me back up and sort of do that for a little bit. Right, so those of you again who are, are multi-timers know that though we're not in a black church, I'm always of the black church. Um, and there's somewhere in the Bible says the two touch and agree, there shall I, I appear. Um, that's not quite what he does, um, but it's pretty darn close. If you think about the best times of your life, there is always, almost always someone else there. If you think about the worst times in your life, there's always someone else who's absolutely to blame because it's never you. Um, and those sets of close relationships, um, those sets of distal relationships are how we get jobs, how we get over, how we get depressed and how we get cured of that, what a good time looks like and what absolute hell is. Those networks of people. There's a new science of networks um, that Andy kind of walked into and then he said, you know what? None of this is being applied to the most important things. It's being applied on, in terms of how to get money out of your pocket. It's being applied to uh, how to gener generate um, uh, the right kind of fake news for you on Facebook. But it's not being applied to making sure people don't die and making sure that crime doesn't happen. And he said, you know what? Maybe I'll do that. And so then he did, and he has. And he's one of the most sought-after minds on this topic in the world. Luckily for us, in the world, he's in the United States, and Connecticut is not that far from New York, so you guys are going to have an incredible treat today. Um, I should also say, when you are low blood sugar but you need to feel excited about all of this, there is sugar rush in the back still available, so please make sure there are no cookies on the way out of here. I see students. I know what they pay you. Please grab some. Um, but uh, you guys should not, you not, did not show up to just listen to me, and you should not be forced to listen to me for much longer, so please do join me in welcoming the great Andy Papachristos. So I actually don't feel like I should say anything after that. Just kind of, <laughs> kind of leave it there. But actually, it's great to be back at John Jay. I see the friends from the National Network, new friends from the Center of Policing Equity, um, and I think we started a lot of this work um, together, doing stuff when I was even a graduate student. So for graduate students in the classroom, it turns out some faculty and practitioners will listen to crazy ideas. Um, and thanks for the invitation again. So here's, here's what I want to start with, which is. The context in which violence is on the national, national stage once again, it's actually on this national stage for two reasons. And the first is when we talk about neighborhood violence, right? So I'm going to be talking a lot about Chicago. For those of you that haven't heard about Chicago and the national press lately, they're, they're not having a, a good time. They're one of the cities whose homicide rates and rates of gun violence have skyrocketed this last year after essentially being at some of the lowest rates in 40 years, right? So we think about the context of neighborhood violence, and many of us in this room deal with this on a sort of daily basis in our work. The other element of violence that is appearing in the news these days, more and more often, is police violence, right? Especially around movements like Black Lives Matter, events around Ferguson, and others around our country have really brought this issue of police violence and police misconduct back into the front of our mind. It's always been there, by the way, but it's back sort of on center stage. But what I want to talk about is not necessarily what often happens in the news, especially depending on which pundit you watch, which is sort of juxtaposing neighborhood violence and how bad that is and police violence and how bad that is, but instead to talk about the commonalities in sort of police and neighborhood violence. And what I'm going to talk about today, I am a sociologist, right, is the thing that underlies both of these particular types of violence are durable inequalities in this country. 
for things like structural disadvantage, economic disadvantage, poverty, racism. They create the stage in which both of these types of violence emerge and become social problems in the very real way that I study them and people experience them. Right? But what I'm going to talk about today around these commonalities are one particular type of commonality, which is human social behavior, micro-level human social behaviors that create and sustain social networks. Right? The people you marry, the people you interact with, the things that you do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this growing field of network science, which helps us understand these patterns and how they affect what we feel, think, and do. Now, my disclaimer, because this happens quite often, is when I'm talking, and I say the word network science or social networks, immediately people often jump to social media. I'm not talking about social media, although many of the same principles in mathematics apply. I'm not going to be talking about Twitter or Facebook, and I'm happy to talk about that at the end. But what I'm actually going to be talking about are the real social ties that we have with people, which may or may not manifest themselves in virtual space, but I'm talking about the people you hang out with, the people you work with, the people you live next to, and essentially how those things affect what you feel, think, and do. Because it turns out, as Phil said more eloquently than I did, and throwing in a Bible verse at the same time, was that the people you associate with, you hang out with, you work with, you go to school with, you play volleyball with, whatever it is you do, they affect the votes you cast, the people you marry, the things you buy, what you read, how you act, what movies you see, where you send your kids to school, and all sorts of different types of behavior. And that's what I'm going to talk about when I talk about network science. Because one of the principles, of course, is that you live in these networks and you know these networks, but network science can help you unpack these networks in different ways and, and affect the way we treat certain types of behaviors. So before we talk about violence, I'm just going to give you a different example to make this point um, sink in a little bit. We're going to talk just for a minute about sex. So one of the questions we used to ask people about p predictive values of determining whether or not you got an STD or an STI was essentially how many sexual partners you had. So going from zero sexual partners to one sexual partners basically increases your rate exponentially. And after that, your rate increases. And there used to be a magic number, which was 2.5. After 2.5 sexual partners, your rate of contracting an STD skyrocketed. We can insert a joke about what 0.5 of a sexual partner might mean. But the general idea was we asked people about the number of sexual partners we had and determined a lot about their behavior from there. But what net And if you did that and you created a social world, two partners would look like this. The red dot being the person you asked how many partners they had and those yellow dots being their two past partners, right? But what network science does, and we've learned a lot about this during the HIV epidemics, Rick and I were talking about that very briefly in the hallway, right? We understood that it wasn't just about the number of partners you had, but also your partner's ex-partners and your partner's ex-partner's ex-partners, and you could string these things together. But from a world where two partners meant something to a world where networks matter like, is going from something like this to something like this. And all of a sudden, having two sexual partners down over here on the bottom looks very different than having two partners and being in that larger network. Your rate of infectivity skyrockets even though you have the same number of sexual partners. Okay? And so these are the types of networks that we try to understand in network science, and at least this approach. So what I am doing is taking this analogy and trying to apply it to a different type of epidemic the gun violence epidemic in this country. And often when people throw out that term gun violence epidemic, they do it for a political catchphrase, which is usually followed by send out the National Guard, lock everybody up, and then you just add in your policy recommendation. There's a gun violence epidemic, let's do this, right? But when scientists model it, and I see some of our, our, our good spatial analysts in the crowd as well, so this is not a, I do this type of work too. Usually when we model these things, we model gun violence like an airborne pathogen, right? You see these neighborhood maps and you see these hot spots and the hot spot is hot and it gets a little cooler and cooler and it cools down. That's an airborne pathogen model, right? But what network science is going to argue is that you actually don't catch a bullet like you catch a cold. It's actually more like a behavior. Violence itself is not just an outcome. It's a behavior. It's dynamic. It involves give and take and back and forth. Oftentimes people who are defined as the victim, say in a homicide, are people that might have even started the interaction themselves, right? So we put these labels on it, we think about them, we count them, but what we miss are these behaviors. And in some ways, just like needle sharing during the HIV epidemic, right? 
these behaviors, these things, they get transmitted and they create these networks, just like sort of the sex network I showed you. In all of the slides I'm going to show you that are looking at neighborhood violence, I wanted to tell you before you see it what the networks are. In these networks, every single one of the dots you see are going to be a unique individual that are linked through behavior that resulted in an arrest. So if David and I robbed a bank together, we have a tie together, right? And then if David and Michael robbed a different bank together, they have a tie together. And these things then get linked together over time, creating a network. Okay, I'm happy to talk about the data more. And for those of you that have nothing better to do, all the stuff I'm talking come about it comes from these papers, which, which hopefully some of you, but not most of you, will read. But here are the findings of the paper, which is what I want to talk about when we talk about neighborhood violence. The first finding is how severely violence concentrates within social networks. And the answer is even more than it concentrates spatially, which is a whole hell of a lot. So in one of the first cities we did this, which was Boston, we did this for one, one community, the Uplands Corner area, and we took all the arrest records in this neighborhood of about 30,000 people. We attached these individuals, just like I had suggested, linking them through arrests, and you get a network of 763 individuals. And in this network, keep in mind that every one of those dots is someone we know who's in the criminal justice system, the public health system, the education system. They're human beings. They're not categories, right? These aren't young black men, these are young men with names who live and occupy spaces, who have children of their own, who are employees and employers and students and so on, right? Those red dots, those red dots are the gunshot victims, the fatal and non-fatal gunshot victims. And if you look at it in very fancy statistical terms, what you see is clumping, right? It looks like one of my kids, probably the 13-year-old, took a handful of Christmas ornaments and threw it at the same spot of the Christmas tree, right? You don't see, with, with one exception, you don't see a single gunshot victim. You see two, three, four, five gunshot victims, all within a short space of each other, a handshake away from each other. And conversely, you see whole parts of the networks that have no gunshot victims. And people in this network, these individuals in this network, these 763 individuals, they all share the same risk factors. They live in the same neighborhood, 80% of them are black or Cape Verdean. They're mainly young men. 30% are involved in gangs. And yet the distribution of shootings is decidedly non-random. More than that, this is about 6% of the neighborhood's population, but it accounts for 85% of all the gunshot injuries, excluding self-harm, right? The 15% that's not there is actually uh, intimate partner violence and one stray bullet killing, right? So you see the severe concentration socially, all within a traditional high crime community. So even within this community, it concentrates within a small part of the social network. And we did this for Chicago as well. And in Chicago, this is not a brain scan. This is a network of 170,000 individuals in Chicago. You can't see the ties because it's so large. But we found similar patterns of concentration, 6% of the population, about 70% of the shootings. And we've done this in city after city. Here's East Palo Alto, California, which is not Palo Alto, it's East Palo Alto, which is literally across the train tracks, about 35,000 people. In this small city, you can see the whole string of shootings and homicides right across the middle like a belt, and then whole parts of the network where there are no shootings. You can easily identify where these patterns are emerging. Newark, New Jersey, Cincinnati, Ohio, and on and on and on. Every city we've done this in, which has been about a dozen or so, including New Orleans, Oakland, Stockton, New Haven, Hartford, uh, a bunch of others, I can't remember at the moment, right? We see the same concentration. So that's the first finding. The second finding is about exposure to violence, exposure to neighborhood violence and what that does for you. So exposure to violence, really bad. There's actually nothing positive about it trauma it induces, the injuries it induces, not just to yourself, but to people around you, right? So trauma can be experienced very powerfully secondhand. But one of the things it does is being exposed to violence increases your individual rate of victimization. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. But understanding these networks can also help us explain events that seem quite random, right? And these are the, these are the shootings. Here's six month old Janala Watkins. These are the shootings that spark that outcry for you know, sending out the National Guard, and there's an epidemic out there. Janala Watkins was six months old and murdered uh, while her dad was changing her diaper in her minivan. And that's what the headline said. And when you think about these networks, about this tragic shooting, 
Um, you know, you get the story and the narrative that is about, you know, stray bullets and kids walking to school, which is awful. But like many of these incidents, this was a decidedly non-random event, which I'm going to describe. The intended victim was Janala's father, right? There was some question about whether he's a current gang member or foreign ga uh, former gang member. Uh, he's about 29 years old. He was involved in a dispute about a video game console, uh, which was this was a reportedly retaliation for. But in the network around him, in the 24 months leading up to the shooting, he was arrested 23 times with 17 unique individuals who all had relationships with each other. Now, I want you to think about your closest 17 associates that you've done stuff with over the last two years. It's actually really hard to do, I just want to say, um, especially for those of us that aren't in, in school, right? 17 people that you're going to go out with within two, two years. But he's in this network engaging in certain behaviors with a population of, of people that are also doing these behaviors with each other. But here's the, the thing about this, this what I'm going to call contagion in a second. 40% of them were shot in the 20 months leading up to the murder of Janala Watkins, including her father. He was a victim of gun violence, right? He survived uh, a, a shooting. So here's a, a young man who's surrounded by shootings. We could find him in that network. And it had all these, these sort of spillover consequences as well. So one of the things we did was take this logic, right? And part of the reason it's important to focus on the young men in these networks is to shift the dialogue about what lives we value and to understand that these are lives worth saving. And that has to be front and center in this dialogue. So what we did was took this idea that we could measure exposure, 40% of his associates had been shot, and do that for everybody in the network. Right? We could make that measure, do this analysis for every one of those 170,000 individuals in the network. And when we did that, and this is going to be the most, I think, geeky of the graphs I'm going to show you, we found this. And then I say, we found this, and you're like, what am I looking at? Let me explain what you're looking at. So if you go along the bottom from zero to one, that's what percentage of your friends have been shot and or shot and killed, going from zero, meaning none of your friends, to one, meaning all of your associates. Right? And then going up and down, that's your individual probability of being shot. Not in the aggregate, right? So not sort of, you know, young Greek sociologists, right? It's like Andrew Papachristos's middle-aged sociologists. It's Andrew Papachristos's probability. What's my probability being shot? And what you see going from left to right is this really dramatic curve, especially for young black gang members in Chicago and then followed by Hispanic gang members in Chicago, right? So the more friends of yours that have been shot, the greater your own probability of getting shot. Now, to put this into context, right, the risk of HIV infection from a single uh, act of unprotected vaginal or anal intercourse is somewhere between 3 and 7 percent, and Russian roulette's about 16.66 percent, right? So Janala Watkins father was well above the Russian roulette level, and we could identify that using these data. So it's concentrated. Exposure matters. The last thing I want to talk about is the extent to which these things spill over in time in which they cascade. So what I want you to think about, which it turns out is what happens, is that a shooting happens and someone gets shot. And then at some time later, some of their associates get shot, maybe in the same instant, maybe not. And then a little time later, another couple associates get shot and on and on and on. And it builds what we call cascades. So my colleagues and I, Ben Green and Thibaut Horrell, Ben's mom is in the audience. Give her a shout out as well. I didn't plan that. That's kind of awesome. Um, we did this for Chicago. And here are three examples of these sorts of cascades. So if you're looking at that, here's a, a cascade of 12 victims that all knew each other. So one kid got shot, another set of his friends got shot, and then another, and then another, and then another. In the middle, there's one with 34 people. And on the right, there's one of 64 people. So the one on the right, that's a single shooting that essentially cascaded to another 63 shootings, you know, over the sort of time period of the study. And what's more, 63% of all shootings in Chicago are in one of these cascades, right? Which means victims, about two thirds, are gonna have another shooting that spills out to their friends. And one of the things we found uh, in the study as well is that there's about 83 days between shooting. So if I get shot, that means the people around me are at severe risk for about three months. That really high level of risk for three months, and then it starts to decay. 
And then if someone gets shot, it bounces back up again, and then it goes down. So there's actually a timing of interventions, which can be really leveraged here. So before we jump over to police misconduct, one of the takeaways here is really understanding the severe concentration and the real lives of young people in these cities, right? And that we can identify individuals for potential intervention and prevention efforts, potentially even ahead of time, and do things we know that works and guide services that kind of go there. But now I want to shift to police misconduct. And this is quite new. So some of the stuff I'm going to show you is wrong. But when we think about police misconduct, or I say police violence or whatever other sort of word we want to use, we have a few theories. The first dominant theory of police misconduct is the bad apple theory, right? There are these bad apples. They spoil the bunch. If we got rid of these bad apples, that'd be, that'd be great. We'd fix everything. On the other side, there's bad apples, and then there's, you know, not quite bad apples, right? So at a school of, of, of criminal justice, I can show this, and you know this is the Rampart sort of uh, gang unit from Los Angeles. So when you start making patches and T-shirts and getting tattoos, you're beyond a bad apple situation. You're actually something else. Doesn't necessarily mean you're the whole department, but you're something more than the bad apples. In fact, you're a network, which is what we're going to look at. But more importantly, for many of us in this room have worked with law enforcement, we know that every cop on the first day of their job gets this, right? All right, I'm going to tell you what it's like to be a real police. I'm going to show you this neighborhood. Forget everything they taught you in the academy, procedural justice, whoosh, you know, whatever. We're going to show you what it's really like in this area. When I presented this in one of my classes at Yale, there was a student who was texting her father furiously, who was an L.A. cop, and uh, you know, and she she came up afterwards to show me her phone, and she's like, "Yeah, I thought my dad was gonna say you were full of shit, but really, this is what he said. Well, it's not training day, but yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> that that's kind of what happens when you when you were assigned. At least you know he's he's older than me when he was assigned as field training officer. He said, "Yeah, that's it. That's kind of what happens, right?" So what I'm going to show you now, again, very new, is a set of data collected by the Invisible Institute in Chicago on every single complaint of police misconduct. Um, and I'm going to look at all the records from 2007 to 2016. It's about 27,000 complaints. I'm also going to show you which police officers drew and fired their firearm, whether it hit someone or not. Uh, and there are, have data on about 405 of these shootings. But let me just show you these data because they're public and they're amazing. And the Invisible Institute has done a, a tremendous job in trying to bring this out as an issue of accountability. So here's what the data look like. You go to their website, which some of you can do right now while I'm talking. Don't do that. It's rude. But <laughs> here's Officer Jeffrey Cribb, right, who's been um, involved in 36 acts of misconduct with 12 different people. And then you can see everybody he was literally messing around with, right? And you can see some of the people have only one complaint. And some of them have 12 complaints and six complaints and eight complaints. And you can click on it and see what the complaints are for and what the outcome was. So, so this is a network. When I see this stuff, I see a network. And in fact, the same way I see co-offending. And that's just what this is. This is deviant behavior, right? And it turns out deviant behavior, whether you're in the police or in a street gang, operate the same way. You learn it from your friends, right? And, and you learn it from the people you work with and associate with and are in, you know, share these sort of overlapping with. So I'm going to show you the same type of co-offending network or misconduct network with police officers. And so if I do that for the city of Chicago, you get a network that looks like this, which is about 9,400 police officers. So these are all the complaints. I'm going to explain to you what you're looking at because it's pretty crazy. Um, you look at, you see all the complaints that were filed by citizens against police officers. I will tell you there is almost an equal number of complaints that involve police showing up to work drunk or beating their intimate partners or committing a, cr a criminal act as well. We call those departmental facing officers, right? Or you, you forget to punch your clock or whatever. These are just the ones filed by citizens against police officers. And there's about 9,400 officers over the time period. I can't figure out precisely on any given year, the size of the police force in the city of Chicago with retirements and things like that, but I'm working on it. But the short answer is a lot more than bad apples, right? Um, but what you're looking at, the different colors that you see, these are uh, coming from clustering algorithms. So you're actually looking at groups of police officers, and these extend beyond sort of geographic or unit assignment. So you actually have groups of officers who co-offend together a lot. Right, um, and they cluster and they clump. They actually look a lot like real social networks is part of what I want to show you. So 
you can see, for example, you know, this whole the light orange area in the bottom left. And there you see a group that's kind of spread out, but it's got these dense pockets. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I'm going over that 40% because I don't trust that 40%. It's somewhere around a third, though, is where I think it's going to end up. What I want to show you something which goes back to the bad apples phenomenon, which is the vast majority of police officers have one complaint, actually, right? They have a complaint. Like, that's the modal number, one. And some officers have 125, <laughs> right? Some of those officers with 125 are, were, in fact, police commanders. Some of them have received numerous commendations, and there's a lot of other things going on. But one of the things our statistical models are finding is that, in fact, these officers that have a high number of complaints actually attract, like, complaints as if they were a magnet. They pull people around them somehow, and those people around them actually don't do so well after that, right? So the bad apple spoils the bunch truly, but in a way that is, is not the analogy doesn't work. It is contagious as well, is what we're going to start to look at. But this distribution, this is how real networks work. This is how shootings look, right? So if I did this for arrest networks, most people get arrested once. Most people don't get arrested 121 times. But you see this distribution that makes it look the way it does. So what are we looking at in this area, right? So again, we just started this last sort of fiscal year. Um, we're going to look at the structure of this network. We want to know why police officers form ties. Why do you do this, right? Why, why are you involved in these things? Are you just, is, does your partner just a, a jerk and you keep getting complained again like with him? Maybe. We can answer that question. Uh, is it contagious? And more importantly, how does that local network affect you? And what do I mean by that? What if you're the only black police officer in your unit? What if you're the only woman? What if you're the young new guy and everybody around you is 30 years older or vice versa, right? So we're going to start to unpack these types of questions. But I want to show you the shootings just to kind of give you an idea of some of these things. So this is a slightly different network. Sorry it's not quite as um, crisp as the other ones. But what I want to look at is we threw the red dots in there again to kind of um, see what the shootings would look like. And if we zoomed in, these are the officers who pulled their gun and fired their weapon. And you can see a couple of things. Once again, with few exceptions, you don't just have one cop who fired his firearm. You have a bunch of cops that cluster together that fire their firearms. And conversely, a bunch of cops in the same areas, the same units, who never fire their gun. Right? I don't know if it's contagious yet. So I'm not, I can't say that, but what I can tell you is it clusters, that there's something about it. And it's not just about being in the gang unit or the drug unit or in a particular community. It's not a geographic, but geography is one of the variables we can control for. So I know what unit you are in. So it's not laid out geographically. You can be in citywide units, you move. So if you're in this you know, district in one point, another district in another point, you kind of create and accumulate these ties over time. Good question, and we can come back to how these things are laid out in just a second. I didn't, I didn't I realize I didn't say that, but I look at these things all the time, so I take that for granted. What I want to close on uh, are two things, which goes back to the commonalities between neighborhood violence and gun violence, and really what it has to do with violence prevention. The first is this idea of focusing interventions, right? So one of the things we know from the work around focused deterrence, from the work around organizational behavior more generally, is that interventions, strategic interventions, whatever those might be, by the way, these don't have to be law enforcement interventions, they can be trauma interventions. So we know, for example, getting a rapid trauma response after somebody experiences it can reduce PTSD by almost a third. We know that getting needles into an outbreak of hep C can drop it by a third, right? We know that getting uh, mental health care to a mother can reduce the experience of a child of traumatic event by by actually almost 50%, right? So targeting and getting things there can, can save lives in both instances, right? So if we know and have a sense of who's really in harm's way, we have interventions and many being developed and you know, come out from here with focused deterrence and GMI and VRS and all these different things. They, part of the reason they rest on this logic and there are other ways to extend that. In the police context, actually it could be super easy because it's a hierarchy, right? I mean, let's forget about police unions for a minute, right? Let's forget about police culture, which is really hard to change. But actually, you have a built-in structure that you can tell someone what to do and do it because it's a job, right? Um, but here's the trick. 
changing ne networks is really hard, and it's actually next to impossible. So you literally need something like a hurricane or the demolition of public housing to change social networks. It's really hard, especially when they're built, right? So when we think about the offending network I showed you, part of the reason it looks the way it does is because of institutional racism. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we built housing projects in particular parts of our cities. We built highways to cut cities off and communities off from each other, and those things are hard to tear down. And if you want to change the way people interact, change the public transportation system, right? Change the housing system, change school catchment zones for who can go into particular areas. Otherwise, it's really, 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 really hard. And so the network stuff actually falls at this focused individual level part of interventions. But at the same time that we do that, we do need to work on all these other bigger forms of inequality, which drive the way people behave, the norms that happen in these networks, and the cr ultimately the creation of the networks themselves. So I'll stop there, and I appreciate your time. How are we going to time? So I think we have time for questions. Quite a f we don't want to keep talking, right? Okay. so much uh, for your talk. Uh, I have a question about how to incorporate time into your analysis. Uh, I'm taking it that these clusters are a snapshot in time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering uh, how time figures into it, and mm -hmm. to the extent that these are enduring relationships, when does an enduring relationship become an institutional racism? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that paper I did with Ben and Thibault deals with time, and so I'm happy to you know, talk about, uh, you know, send that your way. But basically what you have to do, so there's an advantage to using things like misconduct or arrest records, because what you're actually observing is a behavior, right? And so behavior is very telling, because you can pinpoint it in space and time. And then this is what we sort of do in the empirical work, and these things accumulate over time. They might dissipate over time. We have to make some sort of judgments on that. So technically, they represent behaviors. However, and maybe I learned this from David or maybe I didn't, you know, don't rob a bank with someone you don't know, right? So in fact, the ties probably tap into something a little bit deeper than just a behavior, right? They actually probably tap into something social, something, something else. And so what we don't actually cap capture is all the other ties, family ties, school ties, neighborhood ties, work ties, church ties, whatever. We don't have that data. And in fact, you know, we wouldn't have at the same scale. So um, in, in part, that's how we, we make some pretty key assumptions on both of these things. We have a little bit more about the mobility of the police officers because we can track their careers a, a, in a different way than we can, say, with uh, the other people in the networks. Now, when does it become institutional racism? That is a great question. Um, what I can tell you is we're in the process of building, um, taking that network in Chicago and rewinding it 30 years to look at other instances of contact with the justice system, the mental health system, foster care, sort of all these systems that are there to, uh, in theory, improve or tamp down sort of these interactions. I don't have a time zero, right? I can't go back to when they built those housing projects or constructed an expressway or, um, you know, did these other sorts of things. I think when something is really enduring, however, which is when it becomes an institution, um, you know, in the network sense, we have a structure when it's durable, right? So when something is more than fleeting, we call it a structure. So if you and I are waiting for a bus and we have a conversation, we don't really have a network tie, but if we wait for the bus every day together and then we know about each other's kids and then we know each other's name, then the tie sort of starts to form. You know, I mentioned public housing because this is one of these patterns where, you know, the networks don't tell you about the history of public housing, but when you do look at, say, geography, that becomes one of the clear explanations. And also some of the patterns, um, I'm not going to go back, but in Newark you saw these very distinct like bubbles. Those were all unique housing projects, right? And the way Newark was sort of displaced. New Haven has a lot of smaller networks that are kind of spread out and disconnected, which is a function of the city and the fact that Yale is like right in the middle of the city at like this feudal castle and the other things are kind of peppered around it. And so it will affect sort of how these things look. And then, you know, answering that in the context of policing is a little trickier because I just started doing this. Um, I will tell you, though, you know, the different differential race effects that may or may not pop up, I think, will be, uh, you know, patterns, that evidence of it. But really, it's when it becomes durable 
and race sort of, it, from my, as a network person, when these durable race effects exist beyond individuals, that's sort of an indication of, of some of these things. Yes, sir. Sorry, um, New York and Los Angeles have both had their share of police scandals, but in New York and Los Angeles, the homicide rate has continued to come down um, for the last 30 years, and Chicago has spiked. Is there anything I that you've seen in the networks of, uh, uh, of these young men who are engaged in, in, in these behaviors that's different in Chicago from New York and Los Angeles, or any reason why this violence has, has ticked up so much recently? Yeah, so I'm gonna answer that a couple different ways. So, so first of all, most important thing to realize is that Chicago's homicide rate plummeted to its lowest in 40 years. It didn't decline as fast as New York or Los Angeles, but it basically went down and then has since been flat the last eight years, and then last year it went up. That's actually really important to make a distinction there. So it's not that Chicago, so look, Chicago is not Baltimore. Chicago is not New Haven or Milwaukee. So Milwaukee bucked the trend and went up when everybody else went down. So did Stockton, so did New Haven. Chicago followed the national trend, it just wasn't as steep. So that part is actually really important. The second part is it's New York that's weird and not Chicago or LA. And Chicago and LA, except for the last 15 years, that was the right comparison to make because they both had this history of gangs, which New York does not have the same sort of context as Chicago or Los Angeles. And then Los Angeles kind of beat us out in terms of lowering crime rates. So Los Angeles is the particularly interesting sort of case in comparison to Chicago. One of the answers I think why Chicago has gone up of many, um, and say Los Angeles has not, and New York, you guys actually don't know why your gun things, because you call me and ask me, <laughs> and I don't know, right? So you actually don't know why, um, but, can I make a dumping bodies in New Jersey joke, or is that not funny anymore? I don't know. Okay, that's always funny. It's like we used to say that better. But um, it goes back to the role of street gangs in Chicago that were really unique, right? Really, Chicago and Los Angeles had this very unique gang context, which in Chicago has changed in the last decade, right? And it's less predictable, more volatile. Um, there's a lot of other things, you know, the, the number of firearms in Chicago, the different types of tactics, the lack of leadership. I'm going to tell you, and I can't actually prove this as a scientist, I don't know if you didn't have a consent decree in Los Angeles if you would have seen what you saw in Los Angeles. I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, same thing, I mean, Oakland's crime rate keeps going down too, although gentrification is playing a really key role in that. So I have no idea is the answer to your question. I think gangs play a really key role. But it is important to understand that Chicago's trend went down, right? And so the, uh, this phrase crime epidemic that I threw out, it comes out every year in Chicago regardless of what the homicide rate is. It comes every year. And it's usually in March or April, and it comes out. Great master's thesis for anybody who wants to do this. So when we first started doing VRS in Chicago, it had ticked up that year, right? So last year went crazy up. That's not, I'm not denying that. But last year was the unique thing. And the question is what's going to happen this year because then you start to see a, 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 a more depressing trend than it's already depressing. Can crime rates get lower in Chicago is a different way of answering that question. In a city with the levels of segregation that it has, that's a, I don't have an answer to that. It seemed to be flat. Like rates in Chicago actually seem to go up and down and be relatively flat for an eight years to a decade. So why didn't it go further down? I don't, I don't know. When I figure out New York, I'll let you know. Yeah. Thank you. I want to ask if you perceive that there's a challenge in what substance we use for creating the networks, particularly if the goal is to reduce violence and to reduce criminal justice context mm -hmm. or contacts. Is there some sort of perverse interest in maintaining that sort of wealth of data? And do we have any form of alternate ways of mapping out possible offending networks that is not through arrest or mm -hmm. uh, contact cards? So this is a really interesting question, and you know there, there are a couple of different ways to come at this. And you know from hearing me talk a bunch of times that I, I firmly believe that, say, focusing on victims first and foremost, especially when we're talking about neighborhood violence, should be the lesson, one of the lessons we take away from this, which is it forces you to value the lives 
of young men of color with the criminal record. There's no way to reduce homicides in this country without doing that, and that needs to be a constant part of the dialogue. But yeah, we're using criminal justice data. What I can tell you is this, the biases inherent in arrest records, contact cards are trickier, right? Um, but arrest records, the biases aren't always what people think they are, right? So in fact, the people who aren't in these networks are the people who have one low-level drug arrest, right? So they're actually not in the network. So only 40%, I did this very quickly, only 40% of the people who've been arrested in Chicago actually show up in this network. It's a lot, but it's not 100%. Um, you know, these, when you're look, talking about gun violence as an outcome, it is going to disproportionately affect communities uh, of color, right, especially disadvantaged communities of color. And that's, that's something we have to wrestle with. So I think what we've done in other health domains, and this is key, and, and th we haven't done this yet in criminal justice, and of course the, the new administration is going to make this even more difficult, which is we use these same methods to fight epidemics among injection drug users, sex workers, men who have sex with men, and so on and so on. So we have a way to responsibly use data just as problematic in a responsible way outside of the criminal justice domain. So we should be able to do that within the context of gun violence, right? And that's exactly where the debate is. So, you know, I would love a world where I had no data in this instance. Um, however, there are all other types of records you could use, police records. I had mentioned that we're going to be using foster care and TANF and SNAP and, you know, mental health admissions and incarceration. I mean, the data are actually there, and there are other forms you can use. These are actually, given some of the work that us in this room have done, you know, we work with law enforcement. Um, we work with law enforcement who share these opinions. Um, the danger is when these things be, I mean, you know, when they become monetized in such a way that, there's a profit to be made off the young men. And I think that's really dangerous. And I think the, the way around that, to, to actually answer your question, is being transparent, being honest, and actually not shifting from victimization to offending. Um, oh, and besides that, when you shift from victimization to offending, you like cross this massive constitutional line, by the way, right? Which, like, due process. Like, if I'm gonna use this to arrest or prosecute you, I need to show you. Right, and this is this is deeply um, problematic, and I've written about that that last point. So, David, there's a microphone here. The cascade finding is is incredibly important, mm -hmm. um, and I know you lie awake at night thinking about this. So, can we operationalize that as a practical matter to do prevention? We can and we should. And it would look something like this. And you and I have had these conversations over the years. But it would literally be, I, I, and again, here's, to go back to the previous question, this is where it takes some people with some, um, some guts and some moxie and being willing to set aside egos and work together. It's literally like, okay, David just got shot. Let's look at his network. Holy shit, two other people have gotten shot around him. Who are they? They're Andy. Oh, all right. Andy's okay. He's a professor, but maybe someone should check in with Andy, right? Maybe so, who 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 in the room knows Andy? Okay, call him, right? Okay, all right. What about Krista? I mean, it's literally a sense of having a monitoring system, which I'm using in the public health context, that can see who the individuals are, because some of those individuals may very well need an intervention from a trauma specialist. Some might need it from a, a priest or a coach or a teacher or their boss or their whatever. They're not all the same, but we know enough about those dots that we can see whether you're gonna knock on their door or I'm gonna knock on their door, or maybe maybe it's just as simple as a check-in. You doing okay, Andy? You heard about David? Okay, cool, we're here. Can we swing by next week? If you've got 83 days, there's a lot you can do. And I actually think it, it requires, I don't actually, let me tell you what we don't need to do. We don't need to invent necessarily new programs, right? What we need to do is fine tune the programs that we have and make them nimble enough to, um, to enter these networks. So, so as one example, um, and then I'll, I'll leave this one alone, let's say you've got 10 outreach workers in a neighborhood of 80,000 people, right? How do you distribute those 10 outreach workers? And what if they don't know people in the part of the network where the shootings are happening? You've got, you need other people at the table, 
right? You're going to need other specialists at the table because you might not know. So if you think about this with my sister as a teacher, I've worked with cops for a year. Like they can tell you everything about their students or the people on their block, right? And they can tell you about their relationships and their dads and their cousins and everything like that. But then you just go over two miles and they don't know anything about anybody, right? So what you need at the table to make this actionable is enough people that have enough knowledge about those individuals and who are willing to say, you know what, I don't know that person, but maybe this, you know, maybe somebody else does. I think that's what it actually, you know, takes. And that's a hard part, right? Yeah. Hey. Um, first of all, great, great presentation. Um, I had a two-part policy question, but David kind of took my first part, <coughs> so now I'm down to, to just one. Um, so the second part to my policy question was, wh wh what kind of technological or analytical capacity is required within police departments in order to effectively leverage this information? Mm -hmm. And th this question kind of comes on my experience. I've been fortunate to work with a wide swath of police agencies over the years. And, you know, frankly speaking, some of them are better prepared to mm -hmm. conduct any type of analysis than, than others. So I was just curious if you had any insight of what are the technological, um, skill-based, structural requirements for a police department to effectively leverage this for crime prevention purposes? Is that a planted question? I feel like that might have been a planted question. Um, so the short answer is a bit, but not as much as you might think, is, is the first thing. And, and there's actually a solution that's ready-made that, that, that I'll end the question with, which is like, so here's what you need. Digitized records, right? which most, most police departments have. And you need like um, a crime analyst to, to who actually can manipulate a spreadsheet and, and have some very, you know, a Windows computer and some very basic um, capacity to like manipulate data, right? More, more than just Google Maps, right? But not Python, right? So, so a little bit more, but not enough. And so, Th with uh, the National Network Safe Communities, um, you know, we do trainings every year uh, for law enforcement and violence prevention specialists. We've developed a piece of freeware that we give away. We're final. I'm not going to look at people in this room because I'm still trying to finalize the manual <laughs> for this piece of freeware. Um, it's so almost done. Like I swear, um, but but we give we're giving it away, right? And in fact, you know, we've. We have, I mean, I get more requests, they get th the requests, like we do this because it's the right thing to do. And we've had, let me just tell you, um, you know, Rutland, Vermont has been to this training, as has, you know, Wilmington, Delaware, Baltimore, Oakland, Boston, Chicago. So we, you know, Rutland, Vermont's like 25,000 people. I mean, they've got a cop, I think. I mean, but so, so the answer is, and they come and they show up and the guy was, he had it in four hours. So it's, the answer is digitized records. There's lots of different software you can use. Part of the reason we give it away is to go back to this other comment I made about profiting on it, which is, um, you know, I've been approached by multiple software companies about this and there's, there's a market for it and that's an awful approach to just justice, period. Forget criminal justice. And so I think, again, like-minded folks, uh, and you know, when PDs can't afford it, your violence prevention groups can't afford it, and so this is one of the ones where the, the, it's not as high as you think, but it's the one thing that's tricky about it is everyone knows how to read Google Maps, but reading the network maps actually takes a little bit more explaining, and you all did great. I rushed through it. I probably fooled you on a few things because I didn't explain stuff that wasn't intentional, but they're like learning how to read it is actually the most important step, right? Yes, I think, I don't know if this is what the yeah, time, yeah. Yeah, it's really quick. It's really quick. Uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago how difficult it is to change police culture. Yeah. Please share with us uh, the feedback that you've received from police chiefs in here in New York and elsewhere yeah. uh, concerning your research. So police chiefs love me. <laughs> the cops who then get on their blogs, man, eh, not so much, right? I mean, so it's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of variation. I think most big city police chiefs are fairly progressive individuals who know what it's like to uh, police communities of diverse populations. Like, I, I think police chiefs and the cops who are really invested in this 
um, believe in it. I think when I say comments like police culture there, when I think about the cops we've worked with in Chicago, we have some of the, the best cops that work on these programs. They're dedicated. They're not, they're not clocking overtime. They're showing up and buying pizza for these young guys at these meetings. And they do that because that's what they do. But then you see a lot of all the other stuff, which are their coworkers, right? So in that police complaint network, the people that are around these misconducts that don't do anything, those are the people I'm actually even more concerned about, right? And so, you know, by and large, police culture there, what I mean is that's actually something that's quite different. And I had a police chief just recently tell me that community policing starts at recruitment, right? That's the type of thing I think that really forward thinking chiefs will say. But, you know, there's a lot of variation on um, line officers. Just quickly, um, another way that police and gang members are alike is what they'll tell you when you're by yourself with them or when they're around their friends, right? And, and this is also generally true of humans. Let me just say this. But when you have something more, both in the context of, say, street gangs or in the context of policing, there's this, there's this amplification around these two, two kind of entities, right? Uh, masculinity, all these sort of gender dominance, like all these sort of things around rape, they all play off each other. And so what people will say, like for example, I've seen this time and time again, where police will be like, oh, this program, it's hug a thug, right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. What we really need is to do this, you know, and then they're the ones buying the pizza, right? Or they're the ones staying late. And if you could only flip the switch and that those meetings when they're around their friends or at the pub, forget the squad car, you know, that they, they would disseminate that information is much the same way as when we think about sort of the group violence reduction strategy. We want these guys to take the message back to their friends, right? Not just to go back to their friends and be like, oh, it's full of shit. We want them to come back and be like, oh, they're serious. This is what's going on. You know, we better chill out. And that's what I mean by changing, you know, police culture in general. So are we done? Great. Thank you. Thank you.